Mental health challenges are often kept in the closet or even swept under the rug. We know they can affect anyone from adults to children and the struggle is real. Join us as we talk about relevant topics with mental health experts. Welcome to Equip Online, a place for hope and help. Welcome to Equip Online. I'm Brian and my co-host this week is Wally Smith. Hey y'all. And this week we're going to be looking at the rise of depression, specifically really over the last year through the pandemic and everything that this last year held. And our guest today is Kate Turner. And Kate is a licensed professional counselor living in Spring, Texas. Mm -hmm. And so Kate, we're just going to jump right into this discussion. So let's just dive in talking about depression and learning more about it and what we can do if we or someone we love is battling it. Super. Let's talk about it. So Kate, as someone in the counseling world professionally, Mm -hmm. are we seeing from your perspective an increase in the number of people that are actually struggling with depression during this time frame? Yes, most definitely. And you can get online and Google and look at all kinds of research that's been done. And kind of what I saw was the numbers look at doubling or tripling since the event of the pandemic. So that's really quite a number. And studies that have been done across, you know, 1,400 people. people, 2,000 people, University of Boston, CDC. So really some big jumps. And I would say to me, the three main reasons are isolation, isolation, isolation. As I see, as I was in my private practice, which I've since closed, and yet the isolatory effect of this pandemic has been soul crushing. Well, what's interesting about that is, you know, we live in this day and this phenomenon that we didn't even have when I was a kid growing up of social media that everybody says, hey, I can be connected to anybody in the world. And so we're deceived into thinking that we're connected. But what I'm hearing you say is, is that even though we've got this tool at our use, that we're isolated. Yes. Great, great question or comment. And we, God created us for connection. Look at us, gentlemen. We have hands to hold each other, eyes to see each other, you know, mouths to speak to each other. We're, we're created for connection. And although it's well and good and people are watching us on technology right now, which we're grateful for, nothing replaces this human interaction. And God said in the garden, it is not good for man to be alone. Yeah. Yeah. That's so good. Are there people that you're seeing uh, or that you're experiencing are more subject to this? Is there a group of people or is it hitting across the board? What what are you seeing there, Kate? I would say the, the studies show that it's the 18 to 35 year olds that it's hitting the hardest. I would say in my personal experience and in my private practice, it was across the board. Little kids who want to go to school, missing their teacher, missing their people, middle age, uh, middle teenagers, same thing, even though they're on their devices all the time, needing this human interaction, adults who need to gather. I would say it really has had a a broad spectrum effect on, on the whole population. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, I would think that you're right too. I've read an article yesterday about how that people under up to age six were learning part of a skill set that we really developed during that period of time of interacting with people. And after that, it really doesn't happen. So we pull those kids out of that capacity now. And what's that going to do? Right. Yeah. Very much devastating. They need that social emotional interaction. Again, back to it's not good for man to be alone. You know, a little bit of technology is okay. And what we find is everything God gave us is good. It's when we, you know, turn it up on its head and we have too much and then we're missing out on this. So, yeah. yeah. That's yeah, good. It seems like based on the, even that definition or that focus on isolation, obviously that's been exaggerated extremely over this past year, having to quarantine, um, walking through a pandemic. But it does seem like even society in general over the last, you know, 30, 40, 50 years, just modern technology we just don't seem, we just, it's easier just to kind of come home, go straight into our house. We, our society is not built as much around kind of that tribal idea of 
you know, living life together as much. It's just, there's something about even the way our society has been trending that seems like we just keep isolating more and more. Do you feel like that's part of it too, just oh, in general? I do. That's a yeah. great point. You think about the the recent hurricanes we've had and how people come out of their house and they meet their neighbors and it's good. And they're talking about, Hey, we barbecued together. We've lived next door 15 years. We don't even know them. Even with the snowmageddon, you know, I took a shower at my neighbor's house. I mean, they knew I was coming, mm-hmm. but you know, yeah, <laughs> who's this person in our <laughs> hey, house? Hey, <laughs> I'm going <laughs> and um, and I we known them and yet still you know relying on the kindness of each other and reaching out the front porch is kind of no more. But let's talk a little bit about um, what depression is maybe and what it isn't if that's okay. That would be great, right. you know, because it really is. It's one of those words that seems to be in the common vocabulary of most people. It's something that we self-diagnose a lot of times. Oh, I'm depressed. I'm feeling depressed. Oh, you're just depressed. We just it's very, it's used a lot, but I'm sure there's probably some misunderstandings about, and, and, and I don't even know if this is a good way to think about it, but are there, are there sort of feelings of depression that are sort of within the normal um, kind of flow of life? And then are there levels of depression that are just, you feel just incapacitated that we need to be really concerned about? Just, yeah, talk to us a little bit about helping us understand what depression is and what it looks like. Okay. So something you touched on just a, um, a few sentences ago, you know, we all have sadness. God gave us a beautiful array of emotions. Even Jesus was sad when Lazarus died. He wept, right? David was sad. Paul was sad. It's when that sadness lingers for, and what the, the diagnostic manual for therapists and psychiatrists, psychologists, it's what we give a diagnosis with, says lasts longer than two weeks. And some of the some of the events that happen with depression. So sadness is I, you know, I lost my job. I'm sad. I've got to figure this out. Or my best friend is moving to Australia. Those sadnesses are, I, I failed a test. And then eventually we, if we have some decent coping skills, we get over it. If they linger past two weeks and we can't seem to kind of get up out of the funk we're in. And I wrote down some of the things that are in the diagnostic manual, depressed mood for depression. So you just are feel kind of hopeless and, and lifeless and the things that brought you joy no longer bring you joy, weight loss, weight gain, um, sleep problems, either insomnia or hypersomnia where you're just sleeping all the time, psychomotor problems where you really even have a problem with just moving with some synchronicity, <clears throat> um, fatigue, just general fatigue, worthlessness, excessive guilt, and diminish cognitive processing, and just where your thinker is just kind of clouded. And we know that it's also chemical, and we're going to get into what some people can do, and just thoughts of death. It doesn't mean you just because you're, so you're depressed, you, you're thinking of killing yourself. You could just think, um, I had one person tell me once, I just don't want to be here. I just kind of want to pixelate out. I just want to go off into the sunset. So I'm going to tell you a story about me because I had a, uh, I had a major depressive episode a little over 10 years ago and I have, and it involves my daughter. And I asked her, she's an adult, if I had um, permission to kind of tell her story along with my story and just to kind of keep it brief. She was in, she was in her early twenties. Our son was still in high school. She was living at home. She had graduated. She was working and she would just not follow our rules. And hey, I'm a parenting expert, right? You're looking yeah. making me look really bad here. <laughs> yeah, Stop this. I just, you know, <laughs> and and it, she wasn't being wild and crazy or anything. She just wasn't following our rules. And my husband and I talked about it. We prayed about it, and we kind of gave her a 30 day uh, notice. You know, he's, here are the things we want. It's kind of A, B, and C. It wasn't crazy. And if you you know, you cannot do these things or choose not to, then you'll have to find another place to live. Well, you kind of see where this is going. After 30 days, things had not changed. And we gave her her walking papers. <clears throat> and I, as a parent, just felt like I had failed. And, you know, we know as Christians, there's an enemy after us who wants us to think, you're a loser. You failed. You're the parenting lady. And look, you're kicking your kid out. Good one. And I started to get sad and I could not shake the sadness. And you guys, I had all this that I talked about. I'm, I'm a musician. I play several instruments. I didn't want to touch the piano. I didn't, uh, I had insomnia. And then 
during the day, I just wanted to crawl into bed and just put the covers over my head. And it feels physical too. So for the listening audience who's suffered depression and you see those commercials and the person's walking around kind of slumping, to me, it felt like this is how I'll describe it, that someone took a quilt and soaked it in a tub and threw it on my back. It was just physically debilitating. And so then the psychomotor agitation, then just to kind of have a thought process, I would walk for miles. I would just go on the trails and walk for miles and food tasted like cardboard. So I lost a lot of weight. It is not a diet I would suggest, right? And just a feelings of worthlessness. And and I was also, I had a full-time job at this point, I was a school counselor. So I'm going in and, you know, trying to plaster this look on my face. Hi, Kate, how are you? And I'm the bubbly person and I have the guitar and I sing the happy birthday song to the kids. And this isn't a big public school and I'm fine. And you guys know that's an acronym feelings. I'm not expressing. We won't say the other one. That's not kind of, you know, (laughs) (laughs) yes, it's, it's R rated, but this one feelings I'm not expressing. So I'd say I'm fine. And I would go in my office and just kind of sit at my desk in, in almost this trance. And so <clears throat> what I did was I reached out to a psychiatrist. And, and I am a believer. And I, with that, I believe God gave us people. He gave us doctors. He gave us sense. And I called the psychiatrist. And I went in and we did an intake. And he put me on antidepressants. And he said, you know, give it six to 10 days after 10 to eight eight days. I'm like, nothing is happening. Come back in. So I would keep going to see this doctor. He's great guy and tomball until we were tweaking stuff to, and it, it wasn't, I wasn't on this huge cocktail. I just couldn't get up out of the funk. And, you know, I wasn't drinking alcohol. I was trying to stay away from all those things that would make the depression worse. And finally, you know, and people are praying for me and I'm working with a psychiatrist and I'm going to counseling. Right. And finally, it was kind of the the shades drew up on my eyes and it was it would just you know, it's like if you've had the flu and you wake up that day and you're like, oh, I'm better. I'm feeling a bit better here. And it was a struggle. And Jesse, that's my daughter, gave me permission and to 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 share this story. And, you know, she came back later and and told me, she said, mom, that will probably was the best thing you could have done for me. Yeah. And that was, so that's my story of a major, what we call that is a major depressive episode. And, and it's so crazy. We were talking before the podcast about how there's still a stigma and this was in the 2000s. And even in 2021, it's, you know, mental illness. That's, you know, it harkens back to one flew over the cuckoo's nest. We need to stop that. You know, it, it talks about it in the Bible. David was depressed. So that's, you know, so I, all those symptoms I wrote down, I felt. Yeah. And I have great, it's, it's intensely personal. And I have great empathy for people who are struggling. Great empathy. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Thank you for allowing me to. Well, Kate, that really leads well into the next question, but not to project your story Mm -hmm. onto other people, but um, how we probably all have friends, family, loved ones that are struggling with depression, and we may be aware of it or we may not be aware of it. So what would we be wise as um, lovers of people, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, of our people we care for? What would we be wise to be on the lookout for? Are there any, uh, it's not like when, if you're thinking about buying a Volkswagen, all of a sudden you see nothing but Volkswagens on the street. Uh, But are there things that would be good to look for that we should just be aware of, especially in a time like this when depression is on the rise? Mm -hmm. I think circling back around to these symptoms, and if it's someone you know and love well, someone who's in your family, and, and you're seeing, wow, they just don't seem like themselves. Even if they're a quieter, more introverted person, and yet that kind of raises up, it's, it's even more introverted and more quiet. And I would say to parents of teenagers, yes, they need time alone in their room, not a ton of time alone in their room. Or crying, or they'll even, you know, say, I just don't feel like myself. And... 
and just looking for some of those symptoms, what drastic weight loss or some weight gain that just doesn't, it seems out of character or maybe they're your workout buddy at the gym and they just, oh, I just don't feel like going anymore. Or maybe you jam together and I'm like, oh, I don't feel like playing my guitar. And, and then the next question might be, so what do you do? And I think we don't be Job's friends, right? We were Job's friends in the beginning where they had that ministry of presence. You go sit with them. You're there with them. You love on them. <clears throat> we need that connection. And then, you know, if you have resources and now I'm working with Mosaics of Mercy, if they're like, I don't know where to turn. That's a bla- great place to call. Call Mosaics. We can help hook you up. And we'll talk about some self-care tips. If you're that friend or that parent coming in and being there, that ministry of presence, stopping and, and, and really trying to keep this quiet as much and let them talk and listen. There's a great ac- acronym I just learned. It's WAIT, W-A-I-T, and it stands for Why Am I Talking? <laughs> Why am I talking? Let that person emote to you. And then the huge thing, Wally, is empathy, is reflecting back, not saying, I know how you feel. I never did that in my private practice. It would be, wow, it sounds like you're feeling really low. Sounds like you're really feeling off. And then you're that person's like, oh, they're with me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, it's... Brian, Brian's a good friend of mine, so he knows I'll do this. Um, but, you know, I may ask Brian, how's he, how are you doing? And then um, if he doesn't go to the level that I'm wanting him to go to, I'll say, well, Brian, how's, how's your heart? Um, and you can do that sometimes, too, with other people where they tell you, hey, everything's just fine, but you know that they're not. Uh, you can ask that second question that goes a little bit deeper. But I would think, Kate, there are some things that like you had on that list that I would not want to go to. If I noticed that Brian was struggling and he'd been gaining weight, I probably wouldn't say, hey, Brian, it looks like you put on some weight. Are you doing okay? Very offended. If you yeah. So help us a little bit more with that dynamic, what you might say or, you know, what, what you might do. Give us an example. I, I love that. Um, and so I'll just go back to with with you and Brian, right? If you say, how's your heart or, and I'm really big about, you know, the truth will set you free. And if it's somebody, and here's the thing, let's back up a little bit. Let's be preemptive. If it's someone you have a relationship with. Right. That's what we're looking at. Yes. That's what we're looking at. I know you. And sometimes you might have to be a little harsh and say, cut it. You know, I, I'm feeling you right now and I'm feeling that something is off. And if it's something deeply personal you don't want to share with me, how how else can I help you? That's really good. Yeah. Good. Yeah, I'm seeing something's off. How can I help? Yeah. Yeah. Just and, and keeping it simple. We talked earlier, you know, that acronym KISS. Keep it simple, sweetie. And, you know, I think oftentimes and especially in parenting, we talk too much and our friends don't need a lecture. They need a listen. They need love. Yeah, it is good. You know, I, I think about even maybe if there's a, a parent listening right now that maybe it's a spouse, maybe it's a child, something about, you know, I think there's one level what's a good friend, but in our home is tough because, you know, there's this almost this idea that we're only, we're only as happy and we only feel as good as the person our, we're at kind of that level, you know, if there's someone in our household that's just got this deep depression going on. We're all feel it. It's like this cloud that actually we're all kind of connected to it. And so you you talk about the Job friends and, but I think sometimes our, what we want to do is we just want to go fix it. We want to just be like, look, just, can you just not snap out of this? Like, just be happy. Like, why are you, why are you doing this? Like, you know, and, and we kind of, we, we want to end, we, we're in pain too, in a sense, like we're having to go through this suffering. And so I can see that that's a temptation, but it really belittles mm. what they're going through in a lot of ways. It's not, you know, we're, we're acting as if they can just snap their finger and be done with it. Um, it's just not that easy, is it? No. Yeah. And, and I appreciate it. And what you're saying is that we're feeling uncomfortable. We don't like it. It just feels kind of uh, to us. And we, right. So we want that to change for us. And we have to look at our motivation. We also have to, and I would see a lot of uh, parents who'd bring their teens to me. I loved working with teens and I would have the parents come in first and they would just call it teen drama. And I get the kid in there and these kids are suffering, right? And it's not just drama. 
So that listening and empathizing sounds like you're feeling blank. Sounds like you're really, I've noticed, right? People want to be seen and known. I've noticed that X, I've, I've seen you haven't been talking with your best friend, you know, is what's happening. Yeah. yeah. That's a really good one. We love to kind of wrap up and, you know, in every one of these episodes, just to be able to offer real practical help and hope and, Kate, I know that you you really love to share some ideas about what is some good self-care practice. If we want to really proactively do some things that can get us in a better position of mental well-being and in a sense maybe help protect us from some of that depression that's just trying to drag us down. What are some, what are some tips you might give us in that? Department? Great. So I think maybe we'll end with an, an acrostic. And if you're listening on the radio or you're watching on the, on the podcast, then um, either way is great. We're going to just start thinking your mind, the big letter S and we're doing um, down self-care. So the first letter in that phrase is S. So S stands for sleep. We have got, we are made to rest. And we know that when we're rested, that we function better, that we relate better. If you're having problems with sleep, go to your doctor or take a look at maybe what you're, you're not doing. Is there a TV on in your bedroom or lights on? Or are you, you know, having a heavy meal before you, you can Google all that. We've got to rest. We've got to rest. And being a woman who's... <clears throat> Past middle age, you know, sometimes sleep, you know, is elusive. And yet I've learned different tips and tricks to help me to get some rest. And um, E stands for exercise. I, you know, I just, I'm not saying we have to go run a marathon. We were born to move, gentlemen. You know, look at our arms, our legs. We were born to move. And we also know that drops down endorphins, which are feel good. Even that was one thing I think that helped me just keep going when I had that major depressive episode was all the walking. I, I just kept moving. And I think it really, it really did help me. Um, L stands for laugh. I love to laugh. And it is it, that drops down great chem chemicals too. When I was a school counselor, those kids made me laugh so hard. So, and I'm a preacher's kid, so there's lots of funny stories. My dad is still alive. And uh, one, uh, towards the end of my time at an elementary school, I went into the kindergarten class, love the five-year-olds and they're drawing. And I just kneel down next to a little boy. We'll say his name's Jeremiah. And I said, Jeremiah, what is that? I, what are you drawing? Tell me about it. And he, it's for my dad. It's a picture for my dad. And I said, my dad would love that, Jeremiah. And he looks at me, he said, your dad's alive. <laughs> <laughs> Just straight up. <laughs> and I'm like, I hate your picture anymore. I'm leaving. Right? <laughs> I think I was 50 something at that point. Oh, man. oh my gosh. Love you, Jeremiah. And so F, friends, family, faith. We need those things. We are created for connection. And, it, you know, if you don't have a family, you know, if, if you don't have a faith, reach out to someone that you know, maybe that does, I, you know, this is not to proselytize or to convert anyone. We just know that the studies show that people who have a deep con connection to their creator, you know, often have better health and live longer, you know, check out a church. Uh, see, so self, see, um, counseling, if you are feeling like, even if you're kind of in the midst of kind of a hard time and you want to reach out and find somebody to talk to an impartial third party, find a counselor, find a counselor. Another C that I like to put on here is chocolate. I worked with a mom once, really, <laughs> yeah, and she had several kids, and when they were driving or not, she'd keep a little, just a little stash of chocolate in her closet, and if the kids were all safe and well, she would just go in her closet and shut the door and just take a little square and just <sighs> sit in the quiet and let the chocolate just melt and tell herself, this is, life is sweet, it's going to be okay. Life is sweet, it's going to be okay. And then cry for C, if you need to have a good cry. That is, it's always okay. A, ask for help. If you feel like I was back then when we were having that trouble with our daughter and just can't get your nose above the waterline, again, the C for counseling. A, ask for help. Maybe you don't want to go to a counselor. Maybe you've got a good friend. Remember that movie, Crocodile Dundee? And the woman's like, I've got to call my therapist. And he's like, your therapist? Well, we have mates. 
And that was kind of a famous line from there, right? Call phone a friend or call your pastor or, you know, call if you've got a great neighbor, ask for help. We, we've got to get our pride out of the way. Um, R, relax, refresh, rejuvenate. Just what are the things that you love to do? Even if it's take a bubble bath, if it's sit outside, if it's put up a bird feeder, if it's, if you like to turn tunes on and dance, if you like to pick up your guitar and sing, what are those things that bring you pockets of joy? And it doesn't, you don't have to do it for 30 minutes, you know, do it for five minutes, put on your, okay, I love to listen to Motown. So I put on my old school jam and yeah. And I'm just hoping Earth, Wind, and Fire will come on or, you know, Diana Ross and the Supremes. I'm dating myself. It's okay. Those are my people. And then That gets e, me in a better mood. Yeah. I mean, oh, you know, man. I like that. Gosh. Yeah. Love it. I love to dance, <laughs> dance in the kitchen. And E stands for energize. And that's kind of like the relax, refresh, rejuvenate, energize. What are the things that really bring you back up to kind of... Uh, back up to speed. And, you know, if it's a favorite song, if it's a favorite book, if it's even, I like to read juvenile fiction. Sometimes there's some great books out there for 12 and 14 year olds and not even feeling juvenile. I just read it and it's good stuff. (laughs) So self care and it's more than bubble baths y'all. It's, you know, I think about that. I think about the, uh, the verse in the Bible, love your neighbor as you love yourself, that little connector as how can we really love each other if we're not loving ourselves? So. Yeah, I love that. I mean, I, that verse is such a huge, profound thing, but you're right. Sometimes it's, it's almost implied that you would love yourself, but there are seasons mm-hmm. where there's nothing but you feel this kind of self-hatred mm-hmm. and you're just beating yourself down. And self-care is that you know, another, t- another term I've heard recently is even just self-compassion, just having self-compassion, mm-hmm. you know, that it is actually not even okay, but really healthy to try to get yourself well. Mm-hmm. Because if, if we don't get ourselves well, then there's so much great work and people to care for and things to do that we don't, we're not in a, bil- a place to do it until we kind of figure out how to get ourselves. Right. Uh, there's a phrase I would say, if we have nothing to give, we have nothing to give. So we get to, you know, try to keep the tank at least at three quarters. Yeah. Yeah. yeah as, as I'm kind of laughing to myself as you're wrapping up with that last part, the laugh, the, the rejuvenate and the energize. Um, one of the things that Brian would say that I'm known for is, um, uh, is pulling practical jokes, pranks, something like that. So rearranging furniture in his office, maybe something like that. <laughs> So what's, what scares me is, is I realize I have to be around other people. And so I know that um, if I ever get in a situation where I can't work or something, I've got to figure out a way to stay connected to other people, which goes back to the very first start where we started with this thing with was isolation, you know, not being isolated. I know that's so important for me. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I think you and I'd get along well with that system yeah. principal once it was her birthday and I put, my husband's a big hunter and I, I put a, I put a deer decoy in her, in her office with, you know, beads and happy birthday and it was a big buck and she walks in. The, it was good. Yeah. I'll lend it to you. Yeah, Wally. So that, that, no, don't, don't give Wally that, any extra help. That's a great help. idea. So, you know, I feel sorry for the friends of people like us, you know, that they have to tolerate all this stuff that's up. Right. Wally's up to his old tricks. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, we do get a little extra oh, laughter. We though. appreciate it. Yeah, wow. that's right. Well, and I, and I love, I love, that's such a great acrostic and it's so many great things in there. I really appreciate that, Kate. And I'm guessing if you are in the thick of depression, there's, there's a, there's a sense on get ahead of this, like just be putting these things into practice now where however you feel, these are just good, proactive, get yourself in a healthy place. But even if you're currently in a place of depression, right now, maybe listen to this or you, you know, you're there. I'm sure there's some of these things you can, you almost have to do them by faith. Maybe you don't feel them at first, but you just like, you know what, I'm going to trust that if I start eating better and if I start doing some of these things and just like you said, you started walking Mm -hmm. at first, maybe you, you, it wasn't like it immediately fixed everything, but you started because you knew that your body needed that. You just kind of did it believing that these things over time could actually help. 
Right. Great, great point. And I love about the preemptive strike is what you're saying is, you know, what we talked about a few minutes ago, fill that tank, get that tank full because the world will take deposits. It'll start siphoning off and you're like, oh my gosh, I'm a court low. I don't know what happened. And, uh, and also, yes, very much so just taking care of yourself. There's a, you know, a, a phrase, some people like it, some people don't. I like it. Okay. Fake it till you make it. So if you don't, even if you don't feel like putting your tennis shoes on, somebody told me once the hardest part about exercising is lacing up your tennis shoes. Just do it. Right. If you, you know, rather have French fries instead of Brussels sprouts, you know, have three French fries and three Brussels sprouts, just whatever you can do at first. And don't be afraid to ask for help. Even we're in 2021, you know, we, we've got to be there for each other. Yeah. Kate, any, any final word as we wrap up anything that we didn't get to cover that you'd love to just impart a word of, of hope or just a final word on this discussion? I think just kind of circling back to what we just said, it's you're precious. You're, you're, you're made in the image of a holy God. You're precious. Don't be afraid to ask for help and keep asking. If you hit roadblocks, just keep asking because you're worth it and you're, fearfully and wonderfully made and you're worth it. Could I end with one more little funny thing a kid told me once? So back in the elementary school and I had a mailbox. So if they wanted to see me, they could leave a note, Miss Turner, I really need to see you. And I said, Oh, you know, she left me a note. Say her name is Samantha. My grandma's in the hospital. So I go get Samantha and you know, this was maybe eight, 10 years ago. And uh, Samantha's, I said, well, tell me what's going on, Sam. What's, what's happening with grandma? She's in the hospital and she's really sick. I don't know. You know, my mom said something about a plastic sturgeon and I'm thinking, oh, grandma's in for a tummy tuck or something. <laughs> a plastic sturgeon, first of all. And I said, okay, tell me more. And she goes, well, I don't know. I, you know, I'm, I'm hoping she'll be okay, but She's 50. She's lived a good life. Oh, <laughs> and I want to go, girl, get on out of my office. Yeah. Right now. It's just so, yeah, that's right. Sticking and, it to you. Yeah. So finding, you know, and I think maybe ending with that, finding the humor in everyday things. Because we're, you know, we're kind of funny people. So, yeah. Laughter, like you said, is a good thing. It is a good yeah, thing. Absolutely. Well, this is awesome. What a great, important conversation, Kate. So grateful that you've spent some time with us and, and being willing to come and participate with us on this episode. And Kate, if, if somebody wanted to learn more about this topic or wanted to connect with you, what would be the best way to do that? Sure. You, I am on, I'm no longer in private practice at the time. I'm working at Mosaics of Mercy. If you feel like you need a counselor and don't know where to start, call us there. You can go to mosaicsofmercy.com and the phone number is there. I'm on Instagram and Facebook at Kate Turner Counseling. And if somebody wanted, I don't do counseling on social media. They wanted a little more um, direction about where they could go. They could do that too. And I think that would be a great place to start if they really, this podcast really touched them and said, I I've, I need to get my nose above the waterline. Awesome. Awesome. Well, we want to thank you for joining us. And as Kate mentioned, uh, Equip Online is a partnership between Stonebridge Church and Mosaics of Mercy. Mosaics of Mercy is an an amazing nonprofit here in our area. They really are this wealth of resources for counselors, for support groups, for so many different ways that you can get connected and get help in so many different ways from a mental well-being standpoint. So, so grateful for that partnership. And we also want to let you know that you can check out additional episodes and more great resources on our website, equiponlinepodcast.com. And as always, our desire is that you would walk in the fullness of life that you've been created for. God bless. Hey, thanks so much for joining us. We are really passionate about mental health. If you found this episode helpful or beneficial in any way, we would love for you to hit that like button, subscribe to our channel, and ding the notification bell so that you never miss another episode. You can also subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast platform. See you next time.